Hello students, welcome to video lesson 614. Today we are going to be talking about the tangent function and its inverse. Okay, we spent the last few videos talking about sine and cosine and their inverse functions, uh, their domains and ranges and how we use them to solve equations. Um, today we're gonna talk about tangent, okay, tangent and tangent inverse. Just a reminder real quick that, that tangent is really uh, equal to the sine over the cosine. Okay, so remember that, that will be important uh, a little bit later. Um, we have talked about the tangent graph before, but I just showed it one day in class relatively quickly. Um, so I want to um, show it to you again, talk through sort of how we can um, uh, find the different parts of this graph and um, the domain and the range and things of that nature. So the tangent graph looks like this. It's a re repetition of, of these um, squiggles that sort of come up, go over, and go up again. Um, and there are uh, obviously numerous x-intercepts where this function crosses the x-axis. It's actually every point where the sine of x equals zero. And so that would be at zero, at one pi, two pi, three pi, negative one pi, negative two pi, and so on. All of the pi's uh, are x-intercepts. And then every point where the cosine is equal to zero, then the bottom of that tangent fraction, if we think of it in this way, becomes zero, and that makes the tangent function undefined. And when the function is undefined, on the graph we see these vertical asymptotes, okay? So at every point where the cosine function is zero, we get a vertical asymptote, all right? So that would be uh, here at pi over two, That'd be here at three pi over two, negative pi over two, uh, negative three pi over two, five pi over two, seven pi over two, nine pi over two, any odd number pi over two is going to be a vertical asymptote, right? So when we think about the domain and range then of the tangent function, um, we have to remember that domain in general for trig functions is unlimited, right? Because we can go around and around and around the circle as many times as we want. However, we have to remember in tangent, we have infinitely many values for x that make the function undefined. And by definition, then they are not a part of the domain, okay? So the domain of tangent is, uh, if I switch back to here, it is all real numbers, except, okay, so I'm gonna say, but, x is not allowed to equal uh, any odd numbered pi over two, right? So it can't be pi over two, it can't be three pi over two, it can't be five pi over two, etc. Okay, so the way that we um, can write this more simply is by recognizing that half pi, like pi over two, if I were to add pi, I would get to three pi over two, right? Because three over two is one and a half. So I go from a half to one and a half. If I add pi again, I go to five over two. If I add pi again, I would get to seven over two, okay? So I can add pi as many times as I want and find another value that X is not allowed to be. The same thing subtracting pi, I'll go backwards um, to another value that X is not allowed to be. So what we do is we just say X is not allowed to be pi over two plus pi times n, okay? So that is my domain of tangent. Basically, all real numbers except there's a bunch of numbers that it can't actually equal, okay, because it makes it undefined. And I can write that little formula for those points uh, that are undefined by recognizing that they're just pi over two plus pi over and over and over around the circle over and over again, okay? So that's the domain of the tangent function. If we look at the range of the tangent function, remember that's asking what y values can we get out of the function? Well, just based on the graph, it should make sense that I can go as high up as I want and I can go as low as I want, okay? Because tangent is a fraction, so I can make um, this fraction equal extreme values. 
by simply making the cosine really, really close to zero, right? Imagine that the sine was like 0.4 and the cosine was, I don't know, 0 0.00001. 0.4 divided by 0 0.00001, if we do that on a calculator real quick, 0.4 divided by 0 0.00001, that's 40,000, right? So by making the cosine value very, very small, I can um, make the tangent function extremely large. And the same thing in the negative direction, I can make the cosine slightly negative. Um, and make the tangent function very large in the negative. So that means the range of the tangent function is actually all real numbers, okay? All real numbers, no restriction whatsoever. I can get any number you want uh, as an answer for tangent of x. So domain and range for tangent are much less restricted, particularly the range than sine and cosine were. Um, when we go to t thinking then about the tangent inverse function, uh, the tangent inverse function, the domain and range are going to flip flop, right? So the range of the tangent function uh, is going to become the domain of the tangent inverse function. So when I go to tangent inverse, then the domain of tangent inverse is all real numbers, which means I can put in any number I want into tangent inverse, okay? When we dealt with sine and cosine, remember we had to be between negative one and positive one. There is no such restriction for tangent inverse. You can do tangent inverse of any giant number or any small number or any infinitely negative number and it'll work out just fine, okay? And then the range of the inverse is supposed to be, remember, the domain of the original function. So my domain was all real numbers with all of those restrictions. And the range then of tangent inverse becomes that. It becomes all real numbers, but x is not allowed to be pi over 2 plus pi n. Okay? But this is going to cause the same problem that we had with our sine and cosine inverses. Okay? And I'll show you sort of what the tangent inverse function should look like. Um, and then we'll talk about why it's not actually going to work out very well for us. Okay? So the tangent inverse function basically takes all of these squiggles and it tips them sideways, okay? And it, it ends up looking something like this. Where we go that way, and then we go back that way, okay? And then we have those vertical asymptotes are now horizontal asymptotes, okay? And then up here, we do the same thing. We start here and we go back down like this. And we go up like this, okay? And then we repeat it again down here. We go up like this. We go back down like this, okay? And we get these squiggles over and over and over again, all stacked on top of each other vertically, okay? Now, why is that a problem? Well, again, this fails the vertical line test epically, right? Literally every vertical line I could possibly draw is going to cross over infinitely many points of the graph if I let these uh, tangent inverse or these squiggles sort of stack on top of each other forever. So we have to do what we did with sine and cosine inverse. We have to restrict the range of tangent inverse. We have to basically cut off the function somewhere on the y so that we don't get all of these repeated squiggles going uh, vertically, okay? The easiest and best way to do it is right around the origin, which means I'm going to um, cut it off right here, and I'm gonna cut it off right here. Okay, and I might change those to be different colors. Make it red. Okay, so these, uh, these red lines are, are my breakpoints. I cut off the function there. So basically this thing up here does not exist. This one down here doesn't exist. None of them exist except this little one in the middle. So if you were to graph on your graphing calculator, y equals tangent inverse, if I go second tangent inverse of x, and I look at a graph, notice it does show me one of these squiggles, but it only shows me one, okay? Um, I'm gonna maybe show you a little bit, like maybe make this negative three to three. Whoops.
Okay, so that shows you a little bit more that it, it curves up and then curves over. So this is tangent inverse. And like I said, we would have another squiggle up on top of this, another one below this, and they would stack on top of each other forever. But to keep this a function, we restrict the range. So this is actually not the range, okay? That's not what the range is. The range is actually, um, well, if we go back here, it's, it's basically between these two values. It's the same range we had for sine inverse, okay? It's negative pi over two to pi over two. That is my restricted range for tangent inverse, okay? What that means is when you put in on your calculator tangent inverse of something, it's always going to give you a value that again, just like it was with sine inverse, is on the right hand side of the unit circle, okay? It's gonna be this side of the unit circle, okay? This right hand side. So we're gonna have to do a little bit of work then, of course, to find the other answer when we do tangent inverse, right? So let's talk a little bit about tangent, uh, just with an example from uh, our unit circle that, that we should be able to um, find without too much trouble. If I'm gonna to try to solve this equation, tangent of x equals one, I'm looking for somewhere on my unit circle where the tangent equals one. But remember that tangent is sine over cosine. So if this fraction, sine over cosine, is gonna equal one, what has to be true of sine and cosine? Well, sine and cosine need to be the same, right? Because if a fraction is going to equal one, it would need to say something like two over two or 0.3 over 0.3. So I need somewhere that the sine and cosine values are the same. So look on your unit circle and find me a spot where the sine and cosine values are exactly the same. The first point that you should find is right here at pi over four. Okay, at pi over four, the sine and the cosine values are precisely the same. Both of them are radical two over two. So when we put radical two over two over radical two over two, it just becomes one. So this angle here in my unit circle is a value of x that would make this equation true. So x is equal to pi over four. Okay, just so that we're, we're clear, we can find that if it's not something we can find from our unit circle very well, we can always do the tangent inverse of one and it should give us the same thing. So if I go back here on my calculator and I go tangent inverse of one, I get 0.78539816342. I'm just gonna confirm that that is the same as pi over four. It certainly is, okay? So tangent inverse gives me one answer one value of x that makes this true, okay? But there is a second value of x in my unit circle that makes this true, okay? Because if, um, well, maybe on our, on our unit circle, we can find another spot where the sine and cosine are precisely the same. Now, at this time, they're both gonna be negative, which means we're gonna be negative in the x, negative in the y, we're gonna be in quadrant three down in this region. Um, but the spot where those uh, sine and cosine values are the same is actually basically exactly the reflection of pi over four. So this point right here, which uh, I believe is five pi over four, whoops, that's a terrible five. Five pi over four. Okay, is another value where the tangent is equal to one because it's negative radical two over two over negative radical two over two. Okay, so pi over four, five pi over four, um, that's my two values of x. Now, if we didn't know from our unit circle, this picture should help us figure out how do I go from the first answer that my calculator gives me to the second answer on the unit circle. Well, notice what I did here, right? I just went from this angle and I went this much more. Okay, but that's a straight line, right? So think about how much more did I go in terms of an angle, this red angle right here, from pi over four to five pi over four, how much is that? Well, that's one whole pi, okay, because it's basically 180 degrees. So what I can do 
every time, all the time, no matter what, is I can take pi over four or whatever the first answer is that you got, and I can add pi, and that's gonna give me the second answer. Add pi, and you'll get another answer um, for tangent inverse, okay? So you get one from your calculator, you can add pi um, to, to do that. Now, it's important to know that uh, when you do tangent inverse, if it's down in this region somewhere, okay, if it's down in this region in quadrant four, let's say um, I did the tangent inverse of negative 2.5. Okay, if I do tangent inverse of negative 2.5, Basically, anytime you do the tangent inverse of a negative, I get negative 1.19. Okay, negative 1.19 is going to be somewhere in this region. Okay, it's going to be somewhere down in here. So I'm talking this angle right here. That's negative 1.19 radians. Okay, gets me to this point right here where the tangent is equal to negative 2.5. So if you have negative 2.5, but you're being asked maybe to find the solutions that are on the original unit circle, right, between 0 and 2 pi, whoops, 2 pi, not 2 pi over anything, between 0 and 2 pi, you're going to have to add pi to find this answer up here. Okay, so do uh, negative 1.19 plus pi. And then you're gonna have to do it again to find the positive, the, the other positive value between zero and two pi. Okay, so then just plus pi again, and you'll find another answer, the other answer on the unit circle, okay? So if I show you that, if I do this answer plus pi, 1.9513 would be the answer uh, up here in quadrant two. And then if I add it again to find the answer in quadrant four, I would get, 5.0929 would give me this answer um, in quadrant four, okay? Not the negative version, but the positive version. Um, all right, so that's how we can use tangent inverse and the unit circle to solve tangent equations. There's one other application of the tangent that we're gonna look at today. So we're gonna sort of shift gears and um, apply tangent actually sort of back to algebra class, all right? So we're gonna talk about tangent in terms of linear equations in a coordinate grid. So if I draw a straight line, okay, uh, by the way, this is when we get to, uh, there's a math notes box for this between 53 and 54. Number 52 is really the problem that we're talking about though, okay? So suppose that we draw a line in the unit circle, okay, straight line, or sorry, not in the unit circle, in the coordinate grid. We draw a straight line. It crosses over the x-axis at some point. It creates an angle here that we call the angle of inclination. Okay, the angle of inclination. Inclination sort of means incline. Like how steep of an incline is that line um, going at, all right? So that angle, if I were to uh, just drop this down here, I'm gonna make a triangle and relate this back to tangent, okay? So for this angle theta, the angle that this line makes with the x-axis, this, um, if we think of it in terms of rise and run, this right here is rise and this right here is run. If you were to do the tangent of this angle, remember that tangent when we first learned it, SOHCAHTOA, right, tangent T-O-A, opposite over adjacent, that ends up being exactly the rise or the Y change over the run, which is the X change. So for theta, the opposite side is the rise, the adjacent side is the run, so the tangent of this theta angle is precisely the slope of my straight line, okay? And that's always true for the angle of inclination. The tangent of the angle of inclination, the tangent of that angle is always the slope of the line. So we can write ourselves a little formula like this and use it not only to find the slope if we know the angle of inclination, but we can find the angle of inclination if we know the slope. So for example, if a line has a slope of two thirds, what angle does it make with the x-axis? Well, don't I know that the slope of two thirds, that fraction is the tangent of theta, right? The angle that I'm looking for, if I did the tangent of it, I'd get two thirds. Well, this is exactly how I solved 
um, uh, equations a second ago, right? We know tangent of theta equals something, so we just go tangent inverse. Okay, the good news about the angle of inclination, you guys, is we always write it as a positive or negative angle that's less than 90 degrees, which means we don't have to do any work in terms of adding pi or whatever to do this, okay? So tangent inverse of two thirds is going to tell me the angle of inclination or theta in this particular example. So if I go here and I go tangent inverse of two divided by three, I get 0.588, okay? That's in radians, so 0.588 radians. If I wanted that answer in degrees, because now I'm talking about an angle in a triangle or an angle that I might want in degrees, I just switch back to degree mode. Okay, switch back to degree mode and then do that again, tangent inverse of two thirds, 33.7 about, okay, 33.7 degrees, 33.7 degrees. Okay, so if a line has a slope of negative 2.5, what angle does it make with the x-axis? Well, tangent inverse of negative 2.5 is gonna tell me the angle for this particular slope. Negative 68.2 degrees, or if I want it in radian mode, it's negative 1.19. Okay, so this is negative 1.19 radians or negative 68.2 degrees. Okay, and then you can also obviously find the slope if you know the angle that the line makes. If, an, if a line makes an angle of two radians with the x-axis, what is the slope? Well, remember that the tangent of the angle is equal to the slope of the function, right? Is equal to the slope. So what is the tangent of two? Now make sure that, notice I'm in radians here, right? So I wanna make sure I'm in radian mode. Check the mode, radian mode, okay? I'm gonna do the tangent, not the tangent inverse. Tangent, because I want, I know the angle, right? Tangent of this angle is gonna give me my slope of negative 2.185. Okay, the slope here uh, is negative 2.185. 2.185. So that's the slope, which means uh, it's going to go, you know, down like this. Okay, negative 2.185 uh, is the slope for that angle. Okay, so we can use this little formula, tangent of the angle of inclination equals the slope, to find one or the other. All right. If you have any questions at all about the tangent function, the tangent inverse function or any of the applications we've looked at here, it's domain and range or anything like that, um, do please reach out to me, let me know. Um, otherwise, you do just have one extra problem to be doing, number 55. It's just another one of these examples of angle of inclination. Um, and then tomorrow you have some practice uh, review and preview problems. If you need help, reach out, let me know. Otherwise, that's all I have for you. We'll talk to you soon.